Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We've just seen a baptism. It's a pretty familiar scene to our congregation, but imagine with me for a minute the scene that usually plays out. The family and the sponsors are all gathered together, and the pastor takes his place at the font, and uh, maybe the little darling to be baptized is wearing a baptismal gown that might be a family heirloom, or maybe it will become a fairly heir- family heirloom now. But either way, everybody's ready for the baptism. They come to the font, the pastor takes his place, and as they approach, we're ready to conduct the ancient rite, which will culminate in the child having water applied to her head, in this case, with the eternal words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, also that the child might receive forgiveness of sins, rescue from death and the devil, and eternal salvation by grace through faith. That's how baptisms go, how they always have, down through the ages and the centuries. But imagine this. Let's say the family comes up to the font. And as the pastor meets the family, he takes one look at the child and he says, wait a minute, we can't baptize this child. Everybody go back to your seats. We'll continue with the hymn of the day. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? It'd be offensive. It'd be scandalous. Because out of everything that we celebrate in the life of the church, baptism is the one thing with which we never discriminate. There really is no prior instruction necessary, no self-examination, as when we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. When it comes to baptism, Jesus' call has gone out to all the world, to all nations. He says, come one, come all. Every man, every woman, every child. If you have sins, then Jesus has cleansing. And yet that imaginary scene where we turn down people for baptism, that is kind of what actually happens today in our reading uh, the gospel for uh, the feast of the baptism of our Lord, Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And as he's like waiting there on the riverbank in line for his turn, he finally comes up and John tries to stop Jesus. I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Now you talk about an embarrassing moment. John seems to think that uh, Jesus has gone off message, and probably John would know the best out of anybody. We call John the Baptist because he baptizes. That's one of the ways that he prepares for the coming of the Lord. And the other way, though, is to prepare the way of the Lord through his preaching. And so sometimes we call John the forerunner. He's the forerunner of the Messiah. And he's out in the wilderness preaching to all Jerusalem and Judea, that the Christ is coming to lay the axe at the root of the tree, execute God's judgment. And so the way you prepare dirty sinners for the coming of the Lord is you clean them up with water and repentance through baptism. And John knows that baptism is for sinners only. It's not for the judge. It's not supposed to be for Jesus. And so that little exchange between Jesus and John amounts to kind of a public relations disaster. That's uh, some dissension among the ranks that uh, maybe, hypothetically, we see in American politics sometimes. And as often happens, though, with the chain of command, Jesus overrides John. He plays his uh, trump card. We'll see what happens um, in the news. But uh, Jesus says to John, let it be so now, for thus, in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Humor me, John, Jesus says. And so John consents. And we can understand John's initial reluctance, because John is right. The baptism is only for sinners. And Jesus is emphatically not a sinner. Although he's God, he is also fully man. 
And as a human being, he shares in every aspect of our human nature except for sin. John has been busy washing away all that sin in the Jordan. The river has become all mucked up with the sins of the world. It's become polluted with human sinful filth. And then here comes Jesus, the pure and spotless Son of God, down into the murkiness. It's kind of like taking a bath in the same water that maybe hundreds, thousands of people have bathed in previously. Not where you'd want to be. And surely, the water of baptism then is no place for Jesus. But Jesus says, let it be so now. Permit it. Why? Doesn't Jesus know what kind of people have been in the water? Doesn't he know what they've left behind? Sin was in that water. All sin. Every sin from Adam down to you. The sins of all times and all places. The sins of Mia as she was baptized in this font to the sins of the very last sinner who will ever be baptized, either here at Trinity Lutheran Church or anywhere else, all the way from the beginning of creation. And that water was the sin that you're in the process of committing today. It's the sin that you'll commit tomorrow. It's that singular sin that clings to all of us by nature. The little sins that you've convinced yourself, no big deal. And then those other sins that you might have committed years ago, but they still keep you up at night. You still wish that you could undo them. There is the sin that so easily entangles you, the sin that uh, you can't seem to shake, that you find yourself confessing time and time and time and time again. It's all there, floating and churning around in the water of the Jordan River. Now, Jesus has no sins to wash off. He has nothing to lay down in the river. This is not the place for him. And yet he says, let it be so now. That filth in the water has only one place to go when Jesus gets down into it. It all sticks to him. Otherwise, you would have a very nasty runoff. And Jesus is about to show us that he is very anti-pollution. So Jesus sucks up all the sin, absorbs it into himself. Let it be so now. And then we get to witness with John why the baptism of Christ is such a glorious event. It fits very perfectly into our epiphany season because we get a revelation of who God really is. We see each person of the Trinity on display. The Father speaking from heaven, Jesus there in the midst of the water as a man, and then the Holy Spirit descending upon the Son. And we hear the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. But you know, even the Father's decree seems a little confusing at first. You think about your own children. God doesn't react to Jesus quite the way that most parents would when the parents or when the kids come in from playing outside and the kids are filthy and they've tracked it all into the house. Right? That's what Caitlin and I have to look forward to. That's what you have to look forward to. Um, that is not very thrilling to parents. And yet, Jesus, God looks at Jesus and he sees that Jesus is now caked in our sin. Now, when we're caked in sin, God is not happy. But when it's all stuck to Jesus, God cannot be more delighted. And it's because sin does not stain Jesus the way that it stains you and me. If our sin is going to be anywhere, if it's going to be stuck to anybody, it should be stuck to Jesus. Let it be so now. And Jesus knows just the place for sin. The same spirit that he receives is going to lead him out into the wilderness, right into the devil's fortress. And that's where he's going to beat him, where he's going to resist all the devil's temptations. And from there, Jesus will go wherever else sin might be. He'll go to the haunts of the demon-possessed, He'll go to the corners with the prostitutes. 
They'll go to the homes of IRS agents or uh, tax collectors. Wherever you find dirty, filthy sinners is where Jesus will be found. He's going around collecting all the sins that he can. Now, where is it all to go? Well, after three years, he lugs it into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where the Father gives him the cup of his wrath to drink right down to the dregs, to which Jesus prays, not as I will, but as you will. Let it be so now. And the Spirit leads Jesus down that gloomy road to the cross. And that's where Jesus finds just the place where all your sins ought to go. And that's in the grave. And then when he rises again, he calls his apostles to himself. He breathes on them that same Holy Spirit that he got in his baptism. And he says, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven in my name. Let it be so now. Now, somewhere along the line, that same spirit called and ordained a pastor who would act in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ and give you that same forgiveness. And through that pastor, God called you to these baptismal waters. Even if you were brought here like Mia, as a little child. And that's perfectly in keeping with what Jesus thinks about baptism because he says, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Let them come. Let it be so now. He calls you to confess your sins, and he calls you time and time again to this altar rail. Wherever you have sin, he has forgiveness. And Jesus received that sinner's baptism in order that in your baptism, where all this was given to you, when you emerge from that font like Mia, dripping, with righteousness and life and peace and salvation, God can say to you what he said about Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Let it be so, now and forever. Amen.